we saw the band in the Casbah, which was fantastic gig, and I love, always loved the Casbah. And the bar men in the Casbah, if you pogoed, all the bottles started flying off the walls and stuff. And they had these wet towels, and all the kids instinctively knew when to duck on her. And I kept getting wet towels in the face, and I asked, where's the toilet? And they said, well, you can have that wall there or that wall. It was just it was fantastic, because I really loved it. Once we got a regular thing in the Casbah, to try and keep it interesting for us, we'd try and do a new song every week. And, that, and it, was also, it was easier to try and write a song than doing a cover version because yeah. you have to work out, well for me, you know, I, was, yeah. I, could, I had never agreed a year and stuff working yeah. in chords and that sort of thing. So it was easier to try and you know, put a few Rod chords together, you know, <laughs> which made it easier for me. <laughs> I saw the band on a number of occasions. I saw them once in the Casbah when, uh, you know, when I was probably the oldest person in the audience. I come up from Dublin and uh, a friend. Um, actually, the son of a friend actually insisted that I come because I was writing about music. Insisted that I come and see them at the Casbah, and I did sort of. And it. one of the things about about great bands is that you know a great band when you hear it. You don't have to analyse it, sort of. And within ten bars, the first time you heard them live, you know, gosh, this is something special. And it's in the Casbah in this sort of uh, overground dungeon. Casbah, for the purposes of history, was actually a porta cabin. Mm -hmm. that you'll see on any building site anywhere <laughs> in the world. So we're not talking about some sort of grandiose venue here. Um, that had actually been placed over a hole in the ground where the previous establishment had been bombed to oblivion. Alright, Casbah, 24th of February 1977, we got £20. Pounds. We've definitely made a name for ourselves. It was fucking brilliant. For our sake, it had to be brilliant. Sound was fair all round. <laughs> fair? I don't think we would have been looked on as a brilliant new group if Billy hadn't demolished the drums at the end of TVI. He just went mad along with me and John, getting all the feedback we could. We're invited back in two weeks' time, and if that goes well, We'll be playing there regularly. Like I said, this is the year of the undertones. <laughs> Classic stuff. I was like, I was like the instrumentals anyway. A twanging guitar is still hard to beat, I think. That's right, you're between Every, Eddie every time I walk well, like, the yeah, street. But, <laughs> the, 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 uh, that's good. You that's want to change up? I'll, I'll make a note of that. Up. You have to remember in 1978, it wasn't that easy to make a record. Certainly very few people were doing it in Derry and we knew that uh, Terry Hooley in Belfast was putting out these records. So we managed to get a tip to Terry Hooley. I had listened to it uh, for two weeks non-stop, every night. And I was, uh, at that time in the 70s, um, there was loads of people who used to come round to our house and every night I played it to them and they all hated it. And then one night a guy called Ricky Flanagan who made podging at the time, we were drinking his podging, and at about three o'clock in the morning he says to me, I, I understand what you're on about, I think this band are good. So I had somebody else and, and, and I wanted to do the undertones. But there was a few other bands at the time that I wanted to do and I was going to meet one band and to tell them that, uh, that I was going to do them because we didn't have much money. And uh, um, um, I met Bernie McEnany in the shop and he was going back to Derry and he told me that the undertones were going to break up if I didn't sign them up and stuff. And I said to him, I'll tell you when I get across the road. And when I got across the road, I said to Mac, tell them they're on the label. What a lovely sound. Uh, I mean, far from it being, you know, an angry, uh, aggressive sound, it's actually very sweet and beautiful and just because of the type of people they were and what they were trying to say and so on. When you hear at the opening of T-Day's Kicks, when you hear John and Damien and Mickey on the bass and Billy Doherty sort of on the drums, sort of the way those sounds intermesh, the first thing that strikes me about it is just, 
how beautiful it is, I mean, how sweet the sound is. And then when you factor in, I mean, Fergal's shimmering voice floating through uh, the instruments, you know, it's a gorgeous noise. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's significant, really. You know, this was a band that sounded beautiful, you know, uh, coming from an ugly place. You know, uh, and while many people would, in conventional terms, see sort of that, uh, sort of the sweetness and the beauty uh, of their music as something soft and mainstream, that was far from mainstream in the bog side in 1977 and 1978. My memories of the earlier days of the undertones before we got signed, and even when we did get signed, it was bedlam. There was constant fights every weekend. Like we'd pack up our gear and come out of the cast and there's always boys waiting to punch your brains out. And even going home we used to run up William Street because there's always guys there waiting to hit you slap. <laughs> I don't know why. Was it dangerous to kind of raise your head metaphorically above the parapet to do anything really that attracted attention to yourself. We did come on in for a fair bit of stick, you know, even you know, even before we were on top of Pops and, and then afterwards, you know. But stick for what though? Well, I mean, uh, well, I, I, a lot of it stems from Fergal actually. A lot of people hated Fergal uh, because he was an exhibitionist. Because mm. we always get abuse in the street, right? But Fergal was the only one who gave him abuse back. He wasn't afraid. We were mm. kind of cowards. So yeah. Which I was, I would have been with you. <laughs> we were going down to get a newspaper and cigarettes, and this kid ran across the road to spit on Fergal. And I, that really freaked me out. Well, first of all, I thought he was going to shoot us or something. And uh, it really freaked me out. And I just could never get, I never really got over that because in Belfast, people couldn't be born to walk across the road and spit on you. But it was just like, here was a band who had even got a, a record contract and this guy was coming over to spit on him and tell him they were rubbish. And I really freaked, I mean, to this day, it still really deterrence me that people could do that. I knew that I personally was uncomfortable there. Mm. Um, I, it, Obviously, didn't set out. Certainly, I don't think at any time going. Oh, okay, fantastic! I've got a bit of a sort of foothold into a band here. This is music is now going to be my path out of here. It, it simply could not have been that developed a plan and that developed a strategy because the, the the reality and the chances of somebody in our position at that time pulling it off mm. were just so remote. It was just not worth thinking about. Uh, the undertones attracted a lot of resentment. They attracted a lot of appreciation from their immediate friends and from people who just liked their music and there were other people thinking like them. But they also were surrounded by uh, suspicion and even hostility uh, because they were, I think, perceived as uh, a group of young people who were uh, not conforming uh, to what was expected and what was imposed upon them, almost as a sort of communal duty, uh, you know, to, to be you know, part of the bog side and the bog side struggle and to simply express that. So it's a, it must have been very difficult for them. And although they express it very casually and did express it very casually, uh, it took away, I suppose, a bit of courage and sort of a steadiness of purpose uh, on their part, actually, to do what they did and to stick with it in the face, sort of, of quite a lot of uh, hostility and, and even contempt. Remember, like it was yesterday, I had been promising that I would go see the searches, and I went with Paul McNally, who, who worked for me, and all of a sudden this record comes on, Teenage Kicks, and it like, I, I mean, it was so amazing, the record, that I just said, oh, pull over, pull over. <laughs> 